demonstrated and put on a simple and smooth. And then my third one will probably be uh, a faithful observation of nature. Um, and they're sort of like my three core beliefs as an artist. And there is a couple others there, um, but they're sort of more secondary to those core beliefs. The communication of feeling, uh, to uplift and create feeling, or maintaining a consistent standard of health paintings and sculptures, and the use of earth colours as a link to tradition and the meanings associated with them. So, going into a little bit about <laughs> my early influences, as you can see, yes, I was born as a child. Um, I grew up in a not so great suburb in Geelong. I was originally from Broken Hill, uh, that's a mining town in New South Wales. Um, we didn't have a lot of money, we didn't have like internet and things like that, so I sort of had to find other ways to keep myself entertained. Um, and my mother had a lot of books that I used to look at as a kid. Um, she, both my parents were artists, so they used to have a lot of art books and things like that. I used to go looking through them, and these are a couple of books here that um, I really liked you know, as a kid. Some of these I got later, but the main ones were um, uh, Ingres, uh, J A D Ingres, he's a French painter. Um, another one was Velasquez, he's a Spanish painter. And I also liked um, Arthur Streeton and Clarice Beckett as well, she's an Australian painter as well. Yeah, so the first one that really had the biggest influence, or one of the biggest influences me, was um, this book here by Ingres. Um, I used to look through the pictures a lot, and they had a certain uh, quality to them that I found just struck with me a lot. They almost seemed like um, they just didn't seem possible for someone to make, like they just seemed too good for someone um, to paint. Um, and there are a couple of quotes there that have still resonated with me today. Um, the first one is, drawing is the property of art. And at the time I didn't really know what pro property meant, but <laughs> look, looking at the, the meaning later, I, it means uh, the quality of having strong moral principles, honesty and peace, decency. So I thought that's, that must um, mean the drawing is sort of like the, the decent, if you have a good understanding of drawing, then your art will be, will be decent and yeah, it will be good. Um, another quote that struck me is, make copies young men, many copies, you can only become a good artist by copying the masters. And that was a really good bit of, um, advice for me is, as a young young artist um, and that was sort of what led me on the track of my artistic process um, and yeah, next slide please. Um, and another artist as I mentioned before is Arthur Street and I really like his landscape paintings uh, I think most of you would know who Arthur Street is he's quite famous in Australia um, yeah, he's just, he's just a really good painter. And the, no, the next one is probably the most influential for me as a painter, uh, is Diego Velasquez. Um, he's widely considered one of the greatest portrait painters in history. Um, and I'll talk a bit about his work later. Um, and he's probably the most that I've learned from technique-wise. Yeah. That's, it, that's probably one of my favourite things by him. Um, and that's another one there. An old woman cooking eggs, painted in 1618. Um, I used to spend a lot of time looking at this painting. Uh, just, you know, it's just a really nice painting. What do you like about it? Um, it's, it sort of has a very strong impact for such a commonplace setting. Um, I think the subject matters, it's very earnest, um, you know, honest, it's sort of like, 
you know, this is something that most people would see in their day-to-day -day lives. But it's painted in such a grand way, it seems like such a big um, statement. And it has a sort of similar impact to the next slide, um, which is open to the variety. Well, this is just opinion anyway, but I think it has a similar visual impact as this painting, um, open to the variety by De Beer. You know, this is a painting where you got these men that subject them, themselves to death for their country um, and the consequences, you know, and everything like that. It's a strong emotional subject matter. It has a sim similar sort of emotional effect as the previous slide um, of, you know, just an old woman drinking eggs. So I think it's just a. I think really also the attraction is the, the, the roundness of all the subject, like the actual the roundness of the plate, the mm. roundness of the egg, mm. and the roundness of the faces. Yeah. Everything is round, and the oak of the Garashi, I think it's like, you know, the design of um, the swords. Yes. And, and then you have like the arms, yes. as well as the fingers. Exactly, and, yeah. And like everything is like, like it has that kind of like relation to the design. That's really exactly. Strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right, the, right. the compositional design is very yeah. strong. Yeah. Um, and it has a similar effect despite the subject matter. Um, yeah, which I mean, I like both of these paintings. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's just a detail there. You can see he's, he's tackling figurative work and also still lifes. And I really like the, the use of colour as well. Um, yeah. And yeah, another mention I was Clarice Beckett. I really like the landscape paintings. They just sort of tend to have a very atmospheric, moody, um, existential kind of aesthetic to them. Um, yeah, so there's some of the early influences. And as I went to this, those are the sort of things that kicked off my interest in art and wanting to pursue art as a, as a career. Um, so I then went to study. Um, I studied the Diploma of Fine Art at RMIT University in 2016. I then did a Bachelor of Fine Art with a minor in Philosophy at Deakin University um, from 2017 to 2021. And I began to try and paint seriously during this time. I mainly just focused on drawing, leading all the way up to 2017 because I didn't think I was quite ready to paint at that stage. I think I needed to master the, the drawing first, as Inger has suggested, um, and which I helped, which I think helped me um, in a lot of ways. Um, in 2017, I visited Moscow and St. Petersburg, spent most of my time looking at the Trechikov Gallery and Hermitage Museum, which is one of the largest art galleries in the world. Um, I've made several studies of ancient Greek, Roman, and Italian sculptures, as well as appreciating a wide variety of old master works from various countries and art movements. Um, from around 2018, I started volunteering at the Olympic Studio Museum and helped to make the sculpture garden map and ran some small live filming sessions. And I began to use sculptures and miniatures and stands that I was by both Carl and Slava Gulbi's work. And Moving on to some of my more recent influences as an artist. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, Leon Bonat, he was a uh, French painter. He fought a lot of famous artists in the 19th century, I think it was. That's a painting Job, or Job, I think it's pronounced. It's a, based on the, based on the Bible, or the story of Job and I think it's a really nice painting. Uh, the attention to detail and the anatomy, especially in the veins, and uh, you can see how old it is based on his figure and yeah, it's, and, the, and the impressionistic painting of the beard, I think it's very well done. Um, it's a good combination of different elements. Yeah. And another one, Bill Helm Hamshaw. Um, I really like his interiors. I think they have a similar effect to Clarice Beckett. 
this kind of moody, atmospheric, existential kind of feeling. Um, yeah, and just the way he arranges the um, arranges his paintings create a certain effect. I think it's really effective. Another one, John Everett Palais. I'm sure you, most of you know this painting, classic painting, Ophelia. Um, yeah, don't really have to say too much. This is a good painting. John William Waterhouse. Um, again, he's another. They were both pre raphaelites um, He is, I think, a really good painter. I think his landscapes. He's, he's got a really good ability of creating a really strong composi composition that use, utilizes landscapes, figurative, and still life elements, which is really hard to do. Um, yeah, that's a detail there. Um, you know, you can take a screenshot, uh, just to cap a small portion of his landscapes, and they can be, that could be a painting, you know. <laughs> but he, he really just uses, <coughs> uh, he uses everything he can to make a, a really great painting. That's another painting there of John Lewis Waterhouse. Um, I think one of the one of the core beliefs of the pre-Raphaelites was appreciation of good artworks from history. That's I'm paraphrasing there, but um, even you know, there's, there's a bit of a comparison here between um, Da Vinci's The Annunciation and that painting there, Saint Cecilia. You can see he's obviously tried to take elements from the masters himself. Despite being such a great painter, he himself would have done a similar thing. Oh, I guess I'll go back. Sorry. Um, you can see he's used a similar composition. He's got a figure on the left, a figure on the right. He's included uh, some architectural elements behind him in the middle ground to create a sense of linear perspective. And he's also included the trees behind the figures that are much smaller to get a sense of scale. This also increases the depth of the painting. Um, and there's a really good sense of balance. The one thing I do like about, I think I prefer John William Waterhouse because, because of the use of, um, the use of color is a bit more unified. He uses a, more of a limited palette and the application of the paint is a bit more textured and sort of scrubby, it creates more of like a realistic effect, I think. Um, yeah, there's just a bit more of a, a range of textures, especially if you notice the skin is quite soft and light, whereas if you look at the, the landscape behind it, it's quite rough and textured, which creates a bit more of a believable feeling. Yeah. Another one. Jules Bastien LePage. Um, I think he's got another painting at NGV. Some people picking some potatoes in the ground, you might have seen it. Yeah, that's another good one. Really good portrait painter, as well as landscapes. Um, yeah, I really like his use of palette. Another one, Dagnan Bouvereau. Uh, similar sort of style. Um, yeah, I really like the use of a limited palette. And the arrangement of light and dark and everything like that to create a strong image. That's another one. And a contemporary artist, um, Colleen Barry. She's from America. I'm not sure if many of you have heard of her. She's a very good painter. Uh, but I definitely think she's up there with all the other artists I've just mentioned. Um, yeah, definitely someone to look out for. She's a really good portrait painter. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of influence from her work as well. Yep. And yeah, so that's some of my more recent influences. Um, are there any questions so far? What, what time was Colleen working? Is she retired? She's still alive. She's yeah. alive. So these are some of my more recent artworks that I think are more successful than others. 
Um, that one is windswept trees painted, I think it was last year. It probably took about six to 12 months, I can't quite remember. Um, yeah, that was, that's a study I did for that painting. Um, yeah, I always do a study for a larger painting that I don't think it helps me. That's another attempt, that's an attempt at sculpture. Um, I, I started that from life. I used a, a, um, a maquette or a, an armature it's called, and I did a, a clay sculpture over the top from life, uh, but then it, I messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> that's the result. It's not quite, it's sort of more like an abstract thing now, but it was it originally intended to be a bit more uh, like realistic, but oh well. That's another one, uh, working class hand is that's called. Uh, that's about a meter by a meter, quite large. I think that's probably the one of the first successful figure sort of figure paintings I did. Um, Who, whose hand is that? That's my hand. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of a statement on like the working class that we see. Um, and I was sort of influenced by that painting Joe mm -hmm. and the lighting, the use of lighting yeah. to create dramatic. It's very, very cool photo, isn't it? Yeah, it's cool photo, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, like the, yeah, yeah. The use of colour. Yeah, and the light, the light in the dark that we get in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah the attention to sort of all the wrinkles and things like yeah. that, anatomy. Um, yeah, so I thought that, that turned out alright. And that's another one that's probably my most recent painting, uh, Martin. It's got a bit more negative space on the on the right, uh, but I couldn't do anything because of the power point. But um, that took probably probably three years, six months, I think. I can't remember. Um, oil, oil painting. Oil painting, yeah. Most of my paintings are oil painting. I should mention that. But, um, yeah, that's a study I did for that one. And I'll go into detail, more detail about that, how I made that one later in the processes. Uh, that's a portrait. Um, I just wanted to paint a portrait. That's my partner, Paris. <laughs> uh, I think that turned out okay. That's, the background is from a Western American painting. I can't remember the name. And that's a still life painting I did um, from life when I was in lockdown. Um, I was, that's not the full composition, it has a bit more native space at the top. Um, yeah, I think it's that it all right. And that's a drawing I did. That's probably one of the more successful drawings I've done. Um, that was for a painting that um, I sold to Shane from the audience. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of my favourites. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, not, that was, not that, not that. But it's not in my collection, but your painting. The painting, yeah. Yeah, painting. Yeah. Yeah, the painting yeah. Um, yeah, most of my still lives are drawn for life, um, which I think is pretty important. So that's some of the artworks I've done, and now we're talking a little bit more about the process and how I've developed my process over the years from looking at the masters. Um, so this first one here, um, I, I, was, I was starting to paint and I had a lot of trouble keeping the drawing throughout the painting process and it, it's quite hard to paint without an underdrawing or anything like that. So I was trying to figure out that, that problem and I came across, um, I did some research and came across this uh, example here, uh, The School of Athens by Raphael. Um, and then you can see on the left, he's done a drawing first before the painting. That's a mural there, it's quite large. Um, and that shows the use for drawing as the necessary first step before painting. Without the drawing laid out in detail and worked out by process of trial and error, painting may not have been 
and being successful. Uh, and this relates back to the ingress quotes I mentioned earlier. Um, drawing includes three and a half quarters of the content of the painting. Drawing contains everything except the cube. So that's a really good quote, I think. And um, ever since then, I've been using that method of drawing, drawing the full picture out before I start the painting. Um, and I worked out any issues, like I worked out every single detail, like or how the composition is going to be, the tonal range, things like that. Um, yeah. And do you ever um, overpaint and overpaint on the same canvas? Like, you know, you see those images of the X-ray Da Vinci or whatever, and there's layer upon layer. And do you work out the issues as well in that method, or stick to kind of the drawing in the first instance? Uh, I usually try and work out any issues in the drawing first. Mm. Yeah, but I have made some yeah. adjustments to paintings if they needed it. Yeah. If, yeah. And, and that goes on to the next process that I've discovered a little bit later. Um, I, I do the drawing and then I go to do the painting, but sometimes, because I, had, I hadn't quite figured out what colours I was going to use, that would ruin the painting. So then I just discovered this example. Um, I saw this in person actually, it's very good. That's by John Weir Waterhouse. Um, this painting uh, shows the use of a preliminary colour study on the left before beginning the final painting. So here he's tried to work out any problems on a smaller scale and he's experimented with hue and tone. And you can see in the, on the right, the final painting is adjusted the final painting to make the palette more cohesive and with more contrast. So instead of like a blue dress, he's had it more of a light purple, which is more unified with the rest of the colors used in the painting. Um, and ever since I've seen that, I've been doing a similar thing. So I'll do a, I'll do a full drawing, I'll do a couple sketches and I'll do a drawing, and then I'll do a small painting in color to try and figure out what sort of colors work best in that instance. Yeah. And furthermore, um, I think I learned, looking back at Velasquez, um, there was another thing I was struggling with, is how to actually apply the paint and how to, uh, what thickness and consistency and and the actual stages of the painting, um, I was, couldn't quite wrap my head around. So I looked back at Velasquez and did a bit of research into um, conservation research papers and things like that, and just to sort of look at the, the layers of paint. Um, and this self-portrait here really revealed a lot of information that I could use. Um, and it reveals many aspects to his process. So I sort of, did a, like a reverse engineering kind of thing. So I'd sort of look at the layers of paint and try and figure out what he would have put on first and what he would have put on last. Um, so if I look at the surface of the painting, especially the edges, you can see a uniform light brown, especially on the top, on the top and the left, you can see a light brown has been tinted over the canvas. Um, and you can assume that that would have been painted over the whole canvas not just that section. Um, and that would cons cons constitute the mid-tone of the whole portrait. Um, and from there, you can probably assume that the dark pass passages were then painted. Um, and then next to the lights is there, the layers of paint, which are physically closest to us. So if you were to look at this, the paint on the canvas, you probably see the lightest layers, the light on the very top and the, the mid tone on the very first. Um, you just go back, sorry. Thanks. Um, so if you can sort of look at the layers, you can sort of figure out on which sequence, sequence you would have put them on. Um, and you can, you can also see, um, if you look at the, the layers, if they are wet, dry, thick, thin, 
transparent or opaque. Um, and yeah, so that's sort of a bit more in depth. You can see on the top left, that's sort of within that first layer. And then um, if you look at the direction of the light, it's going from the top right downwards. Um, the closer it is to the light, the thicker the paint application is, and the more opaque it is, meaning the light doesn't shine through those layers. And the further away it is from the light, the thinner the application is of the paint, and the more transparent it is, so you can see through all of those layers. You can see it particularly in the shadows on the on the left of the face and just below the jaw on the right, you can see the texture of the canvas. You can almost see those first layers of bit tone um, that he's intentionally left visible. And then in the top right, you can see the highlights in the forehead is quite thick, but you can't see the canvas that bit tone at all. Yeah, so that's uh, that's some process drawings. That's a preparatory sketch I did for Martin. I'll be talking a little bit more about my process as I've gotten from um, the old masters, and it will be mainly focused on that Martin painting that I showed you earlier. So that was the first. That would have been the first sketch I did for that painting, um, and that you can see I've worked out the composition, how much negative space there would be, uh, how, the, how dark the shadows would be, so on and so forth. And then next I've done a small oil painting where I've worked out the colours that I would use. Um, and so from then I would scale the drawing to size. So I'd take, a, I'd take a measurement of this and then I would times it by However large I would like my final painting to be. So he was about 900 by 600, I think. And then once I've scaled it up, I would do the full drawing, the scale. Um, so that's, I think that's 900, uh, I think that's 600 by 600. I left out the negative space because it's just a waste of material. So So that was a full size drawing. That's probably about this big. Yeah, life size. It's like life size, isn't it? Bigger than life size. Bigger than life size. Yeah. So, yeah, so it'd be, the drawing is probably as large as the canvas. Um, and then that way, when I transfer that drawing to the canvas, I don't need to scale it up again. It's already at the scale I need it to be. Um, so from there, I've got my drawing transferred to my canvas. I've got all the outlines and everything. I know exactly where everything needs to be. I would then go to start mixing some paint. And how I would do that is I take probably four or five colors. I either use a limited palette of earth colors. And I mix the paint and then I sort of look at my photo reference and I take an average. So whatever the average is of the whole image, I would mix just the average, and that would be the mid-tone. Yep. So once I've mixed my mid-tone, and that's sort of like, if I sort of squint to this, then whatever the, the most average color is of that whole thing, then that would be the mid-tone. So I, make, I mix like quite a large amount of that mid-tone, and I apply it over the canvas. And I'll probably do five to six really thin layers over the, the canvas and I wait for each one to dry. This might take like a week, a week to two weeks. Just put one really thin layer on, wait for it to dry, then again and again and again. So I get a really flat, um, consistent color. So I keep the mid-tone. So I keep the mid-tone and I use that to mix I include, I start that at my base, 
and then I mix my lights and I mix my darks from that base colour. And then any colours that I mix from there on out going lighter or darker, they all have to re originate from that one mix. And I have to use the same colours as I started with. So the final product will sort of be using the same colours and yeah, just give it a bit more unified. It's quite systematic. I can't really yeah, it's a bit complicated, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then the lightest lights and the darkest darks will be the last colours that I'll mix. And I'll apply them last. Um yeah, so I mix from my I, I go from the midtone, I mix my lights and I mix my darks, and they're the two passages that I apply first. And how I mix them is I just squint at the image and I get the absolute average of the lights and the absolute average of the darks. And so I'm going from like the, the most average to specific color. Um, and as you can see, I've broken up into two sections. This is getting quite, quite technical. But um, as you can see in the sphere on the top right, you've got the light shape on the right and you have the dark shape on the left. And I apply a similar concept to the figure. So the shadows is one shape and the lights is another. Um, yeah. So you can see that there, there's, I've got my mid-tone. I've applied that over the whole canvas as the last piece we've done. Then I've gone an absolute average for the darks, I've applied that over the whole shape of the shadow. I mixed the absolute average of the lights, applied that. And then from my mixed colours, I got my lights and my darks, I eventually just work in two directions. I go from that line in the middle and I go from from the middle, from the mid tones to the darkest dark, and from the mid tones to the lightest light. And I work, work in, in two directions. Yeah. And as you can see, slowly mixing, getting increasingly lighter and lighter, and the shapes moving in the direction of the light, and the darks moving away from the direction of the light. So there's so many, many layers at the end there, isn't there? Like they look so tiny. Yeah, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. But in the medium, it looks like it takes a long time too. Um, to dry. I usually mix, uh, depending on what I'm painting, if it's transparent, and I put the medium in to make it transparent, it will take a while to dry. Whereas if it's an opaque colour, I won't put any medium, it will just be thick paint. That dries a bit quicker. Yeah. Um, yeah, but each layer has to be dried before the next one. So it does take quite a long time. You can only really put on this much paint and then you'd have to walk away and come back maybe two days later. Um, and that way none of the paint layers mix so that your drawings always stay the same. Nothing is able to move where it doesn't, where you don't want it to, because it's all dry. Yeah, and as you can see, I've with the Velasquez there, so as the paint layers get closer to the direction of light, they become thicker and more opaque, as in you can't see the canvas underneath. And as it moves away from the light, the paint layers become transparent and thinner. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, that's, that's the final painting there. Did you do that to Martin painting? Was that from life first? Like, do you work when you're doing your preliminary drawing from life? I used to photograph. Yeah, and yeah. so you photograph first. Just because yeah. it's so time consuming. Yeah. 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 Where do you find inspiration? Is it like you go on like computer, like this the library, 
Yeah, I usually use the internet. Yeah, right. Because there's so many different oh, artists and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's good for that. Yeah. yeah. If I keep typing one thing and then it suggests something else. Yeah, exactly. I like that too. Yeah, it's good. And do you know where you're headed next in terms of, you know, trying different methods or your artists you're kind of into at the moment that you're. Um, I think I want to go more in the direction of John William Waterhouse, mm -hmm. where you've got a figure and a landscape. Yeah. That's looks quite challenging. Yeah. Um, landscapes are pretty hard to do. I think they're actually more difficult than figure painting. Um, so I'd like to push myself in that direction. And that's the study for the, the larger scale landscape that you do? Yeah, that one, mm -hmm. yeah. That is that is that like in Geelong? Is that like a place on Yeah. Yeah, it's in Geelong. It's really nice. Place. Thanks. And Jack, do you um, because it's such a a long process to produce a painting, beautiful painting like that. Thank you. Um, do, do you have like numerous works on the go in the studio? Or? Yeah, I have probably probably two. And then sometimes if I want to break, I'll just do something like quick from life, just a little sketch or something like that, just to sort of keep it fresh. Yeah. And what about the sculpture practice? Do, do you Pursuing that at the same time, or, um, or you no, concentrating on the painting? Yeah, it's usually one thing at a time. Like I would switch mediums at the same time. It's, sculpture is pretty difficult, so it takes all my attention. Do you have a new mistake for Carl's sculptures? They're all hollow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Without yeah. the boundary pits. <laughs> yeah. Really. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, as long as it's built up, it's all hollow. <laughs> Yeah, that's, a, that's amazing. Jack, you have managed to get into photography or did photography get you your degree? Did you do much photography now? Uh, I did photography, but I failed. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. She <Okay. laughs> <laughs> 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 got meant to be for that. I think it was just like a technical. Like, I didn't edit it on time. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, when you paint your photographs, are there photographs you've taken yourself? Yeah. 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 And that's sort of part of the process as well. I use uh, the iPhone a lot to crop the image to a certain composition. Um, yeah, I spend a lot of time doing that, cropping it in a certain ways to make the negative space. Do you take the light? Do you take the photo, the light, and the shadow and definition when you're Sometimes, in? yeah. Before you create, yeah, it's quite, quite different now, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, as in like the staging of the, of the figure in this, when I take the photo, yeah, I do spend a lot of time having the light in a certain way from the left or the right, oh, it doesn't look right, maybe having to stand over here, yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you have a favourite medium that you use? Are you going to explore some mediums like for like quick drying? I know I, I've used like um, very slow drying. For me, like I keep it open, it's okay. Yeah. But there's um, like faster drying mediums as well. Yeah. And which I'm kind of thinking about sometimes yeah, I use it the smell, they smell. Yeah, I have used the quick drying, I think it's called like cobalt dryers. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, just speed up a little bit, like, yeah. you know, like if you know you're going to do like 20 layers. Yeah. You um, might speed up just a little bit. I don't really mind too much, yeah, it taking too long, because then you can sort of... No, I don't do actually, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't really like to rush into it. I want to get it perfect, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Time, yeah. yeah. I, like, I like how it takes longer. Yeah. Some of the drying mediums actually, like within six hours, become really tacky too. Yeah. So you might go for a coffee or something, come back, that's it. Like yeah. you can't, your brush starts to get stick. Stick, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 So with your study, it's kind of like almost abstract. Do you mm. attract in any way to look at abstract artists as well as nasty? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can't really think of any abstract off the top of my head, but I think um, there is a lot from abstract art you can use. Um, yeah, even some of it, like Wilhelm, Wilhelm Hammershaw, that's almost borderline abstract, um, his interior scenes. So, yeah. Well, Robbins is a bit like 
like that too, if you look at the other posts as well. Is like, it? Yeah, the way he's like, he's playing with the brush strokes. Yeah. And he keeps maintaining a lot of abstraction in, in, in those areas, in the trees, in the, in the branches, in the foreground. Who's, who's that? In Roberts, Roberts as well, Tom Roberts. Tom Roberts. Oh, Tom Roberts, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, he, like he, yeah, it's very, very abstract mm. as well, you know, the way, yeah. the way he's playing with the paint. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Really cool. mm. Same yeah. games, it's the same games, isn't it? Yeah. Is this the first time you've done a presentation like this, or? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah well. Did you, did you learn anything about putting the presentation in it? Yeah. It's interesting putting it, putting the process into words. Um, it sort of all just stays up here. Mm -hmm. So then putting it out, laying it all out on paper, it's so like, yeah, oh, this is, yeah. It's interesting to look at it like that. Yeah. Well, I think it was really good the way you showed us how the West was, that was his technique and the way you're all doing that. Mm. It really made folk with no, yeah. no idea. Mm. Yeah. It's great. They can put a lot of detail, all those little yeah. inconsistency of the paint, the transparency, the opacity, yeah. all of those little That's what things. makes the painting very interesting though, it is. isn't it? Like the, yeah. um, the various um, uh, textures yes. of the paint. That's, it shouldn't always be the same, in other words. Exactly, you know? yeah, that's what I like most about, that's probably why it's my most favourite medium. Yeah. Because you have that versatility, you can make it transparent, opaque, you can make it thick. Yeah. You can make textures, you can make it smooth. Yeah. And you can combine all those different elements to create, you know, all those different effects. You know. Yeah. So. Well, I hope you have more opportunities to do it, to do the presentation, Jack, because I'm not an artist, but I, I just, I'm an enthusiast. Mm -hmm. uh, but for artists or non artists, it's fascinating. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. The old artists. <laughs> What I'm amazed at is that a person of your age and in your generation mm -hmm. takes so much time to actually do something because oh, everything starts, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. To yeah. actually do what you do is an amazing thing. Oh, yeah. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone thinks it's got to be done now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very true. Mm -hmm. I think you need the right personality for it too. Yeah, he's, he's like, he's, yeah, he's, he's, he's like, he's me. <laughs> you need to have that right personality. <laughs> Just quite, it that's right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. it takes a bit of patience. Yeah, to research. Even to, even to have the will to research yeah. the, the way you do, yeah. you've got to have that like in, inquisitive mind to even like go and have a look. What are you looking for exactly? Yeah. Okay. And and what connection are you going to make with it in your work, you know? Yeah. This stuff is going to be bouncing around for, like, for the rest of your life, mm. you know? So what are you learning now is amazing. Yeah. Mm. What I wonder is, what, what are they teaching in art schools? They're, they're not teaching this. Oh, they're, they're not? No, you've got to pay, yeah, you've got to pay separate atelier. When I went to art so school yeah, in the 60s, yeah, right. abstract was the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. One of the ladies in my art class, she was actually an art teacher yeah. at Hampton High. She was super realist. She would paint a kettle with reflections on it or something, or a tap or a, a, a shop window with a reflection of what was happening over the other side of the street. That was, she did super realist. She argued with the lecturers there. They weren't going to pass her for her certificate. She wanted to do a diploma, but she won in the end. This is what I do, this is how I'm doing it. Yeah. Because they tried to force all of us to do the abstract stuff. Yeah. And she really had a battle because and, of the way she painted. And how did you find, did you find it was a struggle in art school to kind of Pursue that and validate and justify. Yeah. You know this. I bet. Of course yeah. you would. Yeah. I was just dissuaded. What you, want, what you wanted to do? I was dissuaded. Yeah. Like the same thing. I was dissuaded from. How'd you go? Show me on tea. I wonder. Home <laughs> tea was was good. <laughs> I think yeah. when I was at home on tea, like yeah, it was like what are you doing that for? It's like, yeah. See. Who, who, who's gonna go down the Van Gogh stuff here? Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Home tea was good. Van Gogh. Deacon was, yeah, it was okay, but they kind of, they didn't want you to do this sort of thing. And they sort of say, you know, they make comments like, oh, you're just doing, you know, and just doing little you paintings. To have pursued what you want to do. Yeah, you're just doing little paintings. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, you should be doing what we're doing. You know, it's really interesting because then you go on like what's happening on Instagram around the world, right? And you see this sort of stuff. People are like, Going back to this sort of stuff, you know, 
Yeah. Yeah, but contemporary art is going on to. There's, there's a lot of good contemporary art out there. I'm not bagging contemporary art or anything or Dean University. Um, yeah. Just the way it is, isn't it, unfortunately? Take a while for her to develop her own voice. In That's her right. Own. But well, it's strong to do it. Humanity is always had this desire to categorise. Mm -hmm. And have you been in a group show or just a solo show? Any been, murmurs of other shows coming up? Yeah, I've been in a few group shows in Geelong. I had a show last, that was this year, uh, at a Hue and Cry collective, and then I had another solo show at Metropolis Gallery. That's a very interesting collective. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So have you got a studio there? I did have one. Yeah, right. It's a really good mix. Yeah, it's good. Mm -hmm. And are the group shows that you're part of um, similar style, very traditional painting, or do they kind of combine a range of different styles? And it's pretty varied. Yeah, no, that's pretty interesting. Varied, yeah. But is there anything that's continuous that is the same, no matter what method, style, material you use? Is, is this, have you come across anything that's the same across them? Just whatever material you use, whatever subject matter you use or are interested in, is there anything that's continuous that is the same? Um, different techniques or materials or subject matter? I think it's pretty much the same process no matter what the subject matter is. Landscape is uh, a little bit more challenging than the figurative because you have so many different elements. You have like trees and soil and all the sky and everything like that. So that's a that has, that's a bit more different. But the process is usually the same. You've got the drawing and the studies and then yeah, and everything like that. Yeah. Jack, is that paper toned? Is it already toned or you're toning that? That's that was already that's already sort of toned like a sepia kind of colour, yeah. And do you go out and like sit and paint your studies, like say of the windswept trees? Was that a sit and, and draw and paint and then take it back to the studio? Um, sometimes I I usually only draw from life if it's an interior in yeah. the studio. Um, I usually just work from a photo if mm -hmm. it's a landscape or a figure. Yeah. Yeah. Just because it changes so yeah, quickly. Yeah. So when you went to Moscow and places like that, you spent a lot of time inside. <laughs> so yeah, I spent a lot of time sitting. Of course, you would have drawing. Yeah, sitting drawing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that's pretty much the time, yeah. which is that's, that's awesome. which great. So